Let's begin reading together here in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at verses 16 and 17 as we continue our journey through Acts. And so, verse 16, Luke writes, Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who had happened, who happened to be there. And so as I've been sharing with you, again, a, b- a brief introduction just to bring us up to Paul in Athens. Uh, Paul has been traveling with what we would call today a ministry team, and he's on what the uh, theologians have referred to uh, as his second missionary journey. Now, He's already been on what we would have called his first missionary journey. You see that in chapters 13 and 14. And in that, that journey that we see in those chapters, he had begun uh, ministry in a, a place called Antioch in, in Syria. And he had traveled various places and then had returned to Antioch. So after returning to Antioch, he he, he, for around a year, uh, remained there. And then once again, we've seen he set out and began to plant churches. We saw that he had gone into an area there in ancient Turkey called Galatia and had planted a work there. He had been into Philippi, a small area, a small place called Berea. And then he went to a city called Thessalonica. So we've been seeing this as we viewed his, his journey. Well, by this time in his ministry, the gospel has become consistently uh, hostile toward, uh, has become consistently uh, received with hostility. Uh, Paul had stirred up a near riot in the city of Philippi when he had delivered from demon possession a young fortune teller. When he went into the city of Thessalonica, once again, his preaching had stirred up an uproar. In uh, chapter 17, here in verse 5, the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob had set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of a man named Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And so these resistors, these opponents, are stirred up by envy. And they're pursuing Paul now and they're causing more problems. They're stirring up the crowds against him. And, and this has taken place, and so it was taking place, and the brethren had sent Paul away. Now, Silas and Timothy were his traveling companions, and they had remained behind, but Paul had been sent south to the city of Athens. I think I might have a map of this. Uh, if not, I'll fire John for it. Okay. So, you see, I pointed this to you last time. So, you're in Thessalonica up there where it says Macedonia, and he's going south now, and you can see southeast a little bit, and there's the city of Athens, and so he left Berea, and he's traveled on down, and that's where he is right now. He's in a place called Athens. We'll look at that in just a moment. And so uh, they had left; they had taken him there so that he would be protected from further danger. Now, once again, we remember that Paul had been readied for this kind of treatment. You see, when he had been saved, God had told a disciple, a man by the name of Ananias. God had told Ananias to pray for Paul. And you remember that when God said, you need to pray for Paul, Paul is right now himself is praying. Ananias had said, Lord, this is the one who's persecuting everybody. And Ananias tried to to inform God of the things that were taking place as if God was not aware of it. And so God said, no, listen, he's praying and and he's expecting prayer and all. And uh, then he said, the Lord speaking to Ananias is found in chapter 9 here in the book of Acts, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So he told Ananias, this is a man whom I am appointing and anointing, but this is also a man who is going to go through great suffering. Now, in Jesus' ministry, he had made it very clear that persecution is part of the life of a Christian is part of the commission of a believer. You, if you're a believer in Christ, if you're born again, then part of what God called you to is going to be suffering. We don't want that. We didn't ask for that, but that's part of the package in all of that. You see, in John 16, verse 2, Jesus said, they will will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming 
when anyone who kills you will think that they're offering service to God. So Jesus had prepared believers. He was saying opposition, rejection, persecution, that's something to be prepared for. That's something that Paul had been prepared for, and he didn't forget it. As a matter of fact, he would use the incidents that he's going through to encourage other people to hold fast. When he was writing to the Thessalonians, that church that he had planted, that church that he had had, uh, had such a persecution in, in 2 Timothy ch- uh, chapter 3, verse 10, um, he had referred to those kinds of things to Timothy. He wanted to remind people of those things, the things he went through in Thessalonica and the various other places. And so he used that as an example when he wrote to Timothy and he had said to him, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings. He goes, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So he said, you know of these things. As a matter of fact, you're from the area that I'm referring to, and you know these things happened. And Timothy was aware of that. In Acts 14, 19, it says to us that the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came to Lystra, and having persuaded the multitudes, they had stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So Timothy was aware of that because Timothy was from that area. And so opposition, persecution, hostility is something to be aware of. That is something that we believers have uh, as part of the package of following Christ. And we're not to be upset about it. It's the reality of it. There's an old movie. Some of you perhaps uh, might have heard of it. Maybe some of you are old enough to have seen it. It's shown a thousand you know, every, uh, a thousand times a year in different channels on our TVs, you know. Uh, it, it's Saving Private Ryan. And in the movie Saving Pri- Private Ryan, I'll say this very quickly, but just to give you an idea of what I'm trying to say. In the movie Saving Private Ryan, at the very end, the captain is shot. He's about to die. He, he had been given the task of getting Private Ryan home to his mother. And so the captain is, uh, is, is about to die. And when the captain speaks to Private Ryan, the captain was, was uh, overseeing, uh, leading a ranger, uh, a team of rangers. And so as he's about to die, some of you may remember this scene. He looks at him and he says to Private Ryan, earn this, earn this. Well, any military person who's aware of, of rangers and, and their training will know that, that was, that's, that's not right. Why is that? Because what happened with Private Ryan is at the end of the movie, you see him kneeling at the the headstone of this captain, and then he turns to his wife and he says, have I been a good man? And she goes, what do you mean? He says, have I been a good man? Tell me, have I been a good man? And she says, you've been a very good man. Why did he say that? He said that because the captain said, earn this. I lost my life for you. You earn it. Now, many of us were moved by that. I remember when my father went to see the movie. My dad had fought in World War II. My dad's battleship, the USS Pennsylvania, had been torpedoed in the, in, uh, right off the coast of, of Japan, and they exploded. A lot of his, his friends had died on that ship, and my dad was very moved by that. And, and also, there were a lot of World War II vets and other veterans who, who are moved by that, except for one error, and this is the point I want to make as I'm introducing this, is... When he said to him, earn this, and left him scarred for the rest of his life so that at the very end when he's visiting the, the, the grave of his, his captain and turns to his wife and says, Was I, uh, am I a good man? Tell me I'm a good man. Oh, you're a very good man. Problem is this, the ranger motto, I chose this. I chose this. It wasn't thrust on you. I chose this. And in ministry, I chose this. I chose to live a life that would be hard. I chose it. I chose to serve the Lord, to go through opposition, to go through persecution, to go through pain. I chose this. So who am I to complain about what I chose to do, you see? And that's what's going on. Paul chose this. He was chosen, but he followed. Don't be upset when people reject you when they say all kinds of evil against you for his name's sake, when they physically may oppose you, because when you came to Christ, you picked up a cross, 
and you're following him. And the world isn't going to applaud you. You're going to see this in a minute. But the world will reject you. Paul knew that. There's a guy by the name, a well-known minister by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he wrote a little pamphlet called The Cost of Discipleship. And he was put to death during World War II for attempting to and desiring to uh, assassinate Hitler. And what Bonhoeffer said was when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. And so every believer who is open about their faith will experience opposition and for Paul, it had become physically dangerous to remain in this area called Berea. So to protect him from this onslaught, he was sent to the city of Athens, and he left. And when he left, Silas and Timothy had remained behind. They had taken Paul. They had brought him to this city called Athens. And when he's there in Athens to the south, he told these people, go back. I want Timothy and I want Silas to come. I want to know what's going on with the ministry there in, in Berea, in Thessalonica. I want to know what's happening. And so bring them back. Have them come to me. And so now, as we pick up our study, in a moment, he, he's in Athens awaiting Timothy and Silas to bring him word. Now, he's there in the city of Athens. And the city of Athens uh, received its name from the uh, goddess uh, Athena. It, it was thought to be under the protection of Athena, and, and Athena was the goddess that is associated with wisdom and warfare, as well as handicraft. During the time of Christ, Athens was still regarded as an intellectual center. It was a, a seat of learning, if you will, among the Greeks. It was not as great as it had once been. Corinth had, had become the seat of the Roman government and thus had had eclipsed it in that kind of, uh, of importance and all. But even so, it was still a, a city that was famed for intellectual prowess. Uh, there were orators, there were painters, sculptors, philosophers, there were poets, as well as warriors in Athens. It had schools, it had universities, and, and it was still regarded, even in his day, as an intellectual, intellectual center. The buildings, the architecture of Athens, amazing, beautiful. It was filled with temples and, and statues. It was a beautiful city, but it was a city that was known for and famous for its idolatry. And, and Paul is there, and he sees this, and his heart is beginning to be stirred within him. Notice it says in, in verse 16, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Notice his response. His spirit was provoked. Paul wasn't a tourist. Paul wasn't on vacation. Paul was a man on a mission. And he's waiting for Timothy. He's waiting for Silas. And his spirit is now being provoked within him. That word provoked means to be motivated to action. It speaks of being aroused, even to anger. It's speaking of being stirred. He's waiting. And he sees that the city is given completely over to idolatry. There are idols everywhere. There are idols on corners. On, there are statues on altars in courtyards and in, in, in homes. And the slavery to false gods had ignited this evangelist's heart. It incited him. He saw the bondage that the Greeks were in. It, it, it stirred his righteous indignation when he saw that they had been blinded by Satan. They were worshiping the creation and not the creator. Paul, when he was writing to the Romans, when he was speaking concerning this idolatry and the idolatry that saturated the pagan world, uh, Paul made it very clear that, that these people were worshiping creation and not the creator. And he had said, you know, when he spoke to them in Romans chapter 1, he had written to them and he said that uh, from the very beginning of the world that God's invisible attributes have been clearly seen. But the result of this had been futility in their thoughts and, and their hearts became darkened. 
He said in Romans 1, and 23, speaking of the Gentile idolaters, he said, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and, and creeping things. You see, in rejecting God in his created order, they were filled with darkness, uncleanness of heart. He says the result of turning to the worship of creation rather than the creator had been that they, they dishonored their bodies amongst themselves. He said in, in Romans 1, and 27, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. When you are not worshiping the God who created all things, you will worship the creation itself. When you worship the creation itself, you get pleasure from that creation, and that means that that will filter into every way that you look at life, including your relationships with others, which will include your sexual desires, which will include the deviation of those, and you'll begin to love women if you're a woman, and you'll love men if you're a man, and you'll bring shameful behavior as a result of not accepting the true God. That's the point he's making to the Romans. Some of us have seen the uh, statues and all that are still uh, preserved in, in museums. I've been to Athens more than once and had the opportunity of being on Mars Hill. I've been in the Oropagus. I've been there. And many of us have seen the, the very ancient statues, 2,000-year-old plus, that are in museums. And when you look at them, you'll see that they are they're white, you know, and that's the way we look at them. But unless you, unless you have been taught this before, you probably wouldn't know that originally those statues were not just marble, were not just white. They were painted. The hair of the women and the men would have been in detail painted so it looked like hair, human hair. Their bodies were painted flesh tones. When you looked at the statue... You weren't looking at a statue necessarily. You were looking at what looked like a human being in every detail. And the statues were nude. And Paul would see these idols throughout the area. It stirred him not to lust, but to anger at how they were worshiping man and the things that that had led to in their society. They were rejecting the concept of purity. They were celebrating sensuality. As a, as a righteous man, it stirred his heart to preach that there's a greater way of life. His heart was stirred, and that's the heart of preaching. What is the heart of preaching? Well, it's a, a spirit that is provoked, that is motivated into action. You see, this is a world that Paul was familiar with. It's not that he wasn't. He wasn't enamored by it. He wasn't tempted by it, but he was angered by it, not by the people themselves, but by the spirit, the enemy that was, was, uh, was keeping them in bondage. I think we have to be very careful that when we look at the world that we live in today, that we'd be very careful not to be mad at the people per se or the people themselves. But if there's some kind of indignation that's stirred up within us, it, it should be that, that the lost are simply that. Their eyes have been blinded. They don't see, the, they don't see Jesus. They, they don't see the love of God. They're going to live a life that they're gonna, that's natural to them. A lot of people are getting mad today and angry, and there's hardly anything as, as uh, unappealing as a mad Christian. It, it's almost an oxymoron. I mean, angry Christian if we get stirred and we get moved and motivated like this, it should be at what the enemy has done to blind the eyes of those who don't see and a desire for us to keep at least within the love of God an attitude to tell the truth and to love the person so that they might know that there's a God who loves them and can set them free. And so that's what's motivating the heart of a preacher. That motivates Paul. You tell the truth, but you say it in love and you find a way to present it so that they might hear those things. Things. You see, he saw the emptiness of their philosophy. He saw the emptiness of their pursuit of intellectualism, the pursuit of knowledge, 
He wasn't impressed by it because it's called worldly wisdom. In Colossians, a Gentile church, in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he said, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And so don't be taken captive to human philosophy. In 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, he said to Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Speaking of the gospel and ministry, guard that which has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter, the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. So what does he do? What does this provoking cause him to do? Verse 16 says his, his spirit was provoked within him. Verse 17, what did it do? Well, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who had happened to be there. So he began to reason. He began to dispute in the synagogue. First, again, you see he's got a pattern going. He spoke with the Jews and the Gentile god fearers. The idolatry had stirred him to action. So he went to the Jews and the proselytes, the converts, or the God-fearers. He wanted first to begin with them because he wanted to speak to them concerning Jesus. But he also took his message to the marketplace, to the Agora. The Agora, the marketplace, is where the people would congregate. It was a very busy place where there would be a lot of people there. And very often there would be teachers who would come and speak. And so he took the advantage to go there and speak openly in what is called the marketplace. Now, in the United States, there have been places that have been looked at as being marketplaces, but the marketplace very often was regarded as letters to the editor. In our newspapers, that at one time was considered to be the marketplace. Now they have social, social media where, where that's supposed to be like a marketplace, the problem is, is you have censors now who will say that shouldn't be printed. We think that it's the wrong thing, and therefore, you can't give your opinion. And so there's been a clamping down and dissension here that many of us haven't even noticed, like that frog in, in the water, and you turn on the heat in that pan, and very slowly the temperature of the water has been turned up, so the frog just sits there without jumping out because it doesn't notice that the heat is rising and eventually is boiled in it. That's what's happened in the United States. Where people say, oh, you, you can have that idea. Keep it to yourself. Oh, you can be a, a believer, but don't tell us about it. Let me tell you about, and they'll tell you all the things they believe, but when you say something they don't like, well, the marketplace has been shut down. It's closed to business. Paul went to the marketplace, and Paul began to speak, to reason, to dispute. And what he's doing is he's in, encountering the intellectual elite. You see, certain Epicurean and certain Stoic philosophers. And these people have come, they've encountered him. Well, those are two basic schools of thought, philosophy. I shared with you, I'll give you a little idea about what they believed in also. We can, we can uh, look at that and understand what's taking place between Paul and them. You had the Epicureans and you had the Stoics. Now, Epicureans followed a, a, a teacher, Epicurus. He lived about 342 years before Christ. And uh, the Epicureans at that time uh, would be referred to as materialists. A and their, their, main, their main teaching was the avoidance of pain, which led to what would be called a pursuit of, pre of pleasure. They would say, well, there are gods, perhaps, but they're too distant to care about your sorrow, and they certainly don't care about anything called sin. And so the Epicureans would say, well, they need no sacrifice. They answer no prayers. When you spoke to a, an Epicurean, he would say, well, true wisdom is being the master, not the slave of your circumstances. Don't seek what you can't control. Just accept whatever comes your way. Be indifferent to pain and be indifferent to pleasure. You need to become detached from those things. But if you enjoy something, well, pursue the pleasure because that gives you most satisfaction. Life is short. There's no final judgment. Make the best of it. And most Epicureans would settle into a life of self-indulgence as well as sensuality. But there was another group called the Stoics. We use that phrase to this day. We'll say that guy was very Stoic. He was determined. He, 
he, he went through things and, 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 and whatever happened, he was able to accept it. We call it Stoic. Well, they were the followers of a man named Zeno. He was from Cyprus, and he taught around 334 before Christ. And uh, he taught that reason was the greatest good in life, and living in disciplined accordance with reason was your purpose. It's the purpose of human life. You see, if you live according to only your instincts, Zeno would say, you're no more than simply an animal. Well, he had taught this, and then later on, somebody had picked it up. His name was Epictetus, and, and he lived 50 to 130 years, 50 B.C. to 100, rather 50 A.D. to 130 A.D., and he popularized uh, Stoicism. And what happened is this way of thinking had become very impactful in the city. See, people were struggling with a desire for, for something they couldn't have. And they also, and this is so human, they, they also feared losing the things that they, that they loved. So he was saying, well, you'll never be satisfied chasing after something you desire. You're, you're never going to be satisfied in getting the thing you desired anyway because you can't hold on to it. It's kind of like a similar kind of thought that we see in the book of Ecclesiastes with Solomon when he said it's all grasping for the wind. Well, a Stoic would have understood some of what Solomon was saying. So for a Stoic, self-mastery is the highest virtue. Indifference to pain or indifference to pleasure is best. So the answer, if you're going to be indifferent, is going to be apathy. Develop complete apathy. Don't care. Don't worry about it. It's going to work itself out. And you'll have peace. The result of that is a lack of compassion. And they would reject anything that disturbed their tranquility. And though they may have appeared to have peace and tranquility, there were those during that day who said, no, they're selfish and they're corrupt. One writer wrote concerning the Stoics, they pose as heroes and as drunkards live. So, these intellectuals had the response to preaching of Paul that we find today. They spoke of him with contempt. Now notice in verse 18 when it said, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, well, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and, and brought him to the Oropagus saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So they encounter him. They hear him as he's speaking. And they speak of him with contempt. They're scorning because they think that he's shallow. Notice how they, they speak of him as a babbler. The word babbler is a very derogatory word. It, it's literally, what is the seed picker uh, talking about? A uh, seed picker is someone who picks up thoughts from various sources and passes them off as profound, but has no personal insight or depth. And so they're saying, what is this guy? This guy's useless. He's a pseudo-intellectual. What does he really know? What is he really saying? Um, he's just grabbing ideas from different places. I'm wondering what he means by this. And he's a proclaimer, they said, of foreign gods. And so they're showing a dis disdain for the gospel right, right from the beginning. Again, in verse 18, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. Why? Because he was preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection. So when, Jesus, when uh, Paul rather was preaching, he was repeatedly proclaiming Jesus, and he was speaking of resurrection. They thought he was speaking of two, new, two different gods. They said he's speaking of Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus they saw as a god. But remember, they would have been thinking in Greek, they're Greeks, and so when they heard resurrection, that's the Greek word is anastasis. He's speaking of Jesus and anastasis. Jesus is one God. Anastasis, they thought, was a second. So he's bringing two different gods into Athens. What is he speaking about? What is he talking about? He's speaking of Jesus and a goddess. And we want to know what's going on. And that's why in verses 19 and 20, they took him to the Oropagus and they wanted to have him speak to them. Now, the Oropagus, I think I have, 
I think I asked for a picture. We might have it. There's the general area. That's called Mars Hill, and that's where Paul would have been, and I'll describe some things about that in a moment. Um, that's where the wisest of the population would make various judgments. They actually had kind of like a court there where the intellectuals would be there to judge the new things that were coming in. Because in verse 20, it says, you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what, what these things are. And he goes on in verse 21 to say, for all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So they're hearing him speak, and they want to know what's going on. It's kind of like a court. They go up there. He said, they said, you're bringing strange things to our ear. You're, you're saying things that are unusual, even remarkable. This isn't something that we normally hear from our philosophers. So what do you mean when you say Jesus and when you speak of Anastasis? Verse 21 says what they spent their time in nothing else but either to hear or to tell something new. So the Athenians and the foreigners, or the non-Greeks who would, would go there, enjoyed hearing new ideas. Verse 21 says they liked to hear or tell something new, something novel. And what that result was is they were always current with the latest thought, but they, they may have had broad knowledge but shallow understanding because they never went deep into anything that was being said. You see, this kind of quest for the novel keeps you from having a strong foundation there's a reason that I, as a pastor, chose to teach this church uh, line upon line. It's because if you have a strong foundation that you can build your life on, then the things that you see in Scripture can be built on that foundation. But if I, as a Christian, am always going to some new thing, some new doctrine, some new teaching, some new experience. Oh, this guy here hovers as he's teaching. There, there have been people who have presented themselves as actually hovering from the platform. Most of you wouldn't know that, but there was a guy named Kenneth Hagin years ago before he died, and he proclaimed, and it was written, and I read of it, how that he said, it was said of him that he stepped off the, off the platform and stayed hovering and, and then came back, and he didn't fall. Gravity had no power over him, and people will go to hear these kinds of things and see these things. They're always looking for something new, something novel, instead of building on the things they already know. And that's how the Athenians were. They're always wanting to hear something new. And a lot of Christians are like that. You're never grounded. You're floating from thought to thought, from place to place, from church to church, from teacher to teacher, and never grounded. In Proverbs 14, 6, a scoffer seeks wisdom and doesn't find it. Knowledge is easy to him who understands. And that's what I was saying. Many today say if it's novel, it's true. Well, verse 22 Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now, he's standing in the open. In front of him, are, it's like a plateau, are, are these intellectuals like judges, and they're seated around him. So you can see Paul standing, and they're above him, and that could be very intimidating. And as they're looking down on him, wanting to hear what he has to say, it could cause him to be very intimidated. But what he's doing is he's looking for what we today would refer to as a hook, and notice in verse 22, he says, I perceive that you are very religious. That's a very gracious introduction. He's not intimidated by them. He's speaking openly to them, but he's polite. I see that you have a great interest in knowing and worshiping your gods. Now, I was passing by verse 23, and I was considering the objects of your worship. See, as a Jewish Christian... He wouldn't credit them with true worship. True worship is refer, reserved for those who worship in spirit and truth. It's your worship that I'm going to address. And he right away begins to point out that there are difference between what they worship and what true worship is. I recognize that you are devoted to your own system of God. When you, uh, and I'll say this very quickly here, but it's practical. There are those in this room, I'm sure, are watching online. 
You like to give away your faith, and so this is one thing you've probably learned and something let me encourage you in, is when you're speaking to somebody who doesn't share your faith or your belief, it's always a good thing to be polite and, and kind in your conversation. It isn't a good idea to get into somebody's face. It's a good thing to know what they're talking about, to know what they believe, and if there are points of difference, to point it out in a respectful way. When Marie asked me to marry her, I mean, when I asked Marie to... I played hard to get. When she... When we determined we were going to get married, her mama is very devout Catholic. And we believed at that time that she wouldn't come to our wedding if it wasn't in the Catholic Church. She's very devout. I mean, her mama used to come in and throw holy water on Marie when she was sleepy. She's very devout. I love my mother-in-law very deeply. That was her way. And so Marie and I were talking about getting married, and so we knew that she wouldn't come to a quote-unquote Protestant church. We knew that. Because there was a time when, when even I, I was raised Catholic, so there was a time when we were told you shouldn't go, but if you go, don't listen to what's being said. That's how I was raised in my catechism classes as a little boy. If you go in, don't believe them. We were taught that in catechism. Well, you're not really supposed to go into Protestant churches, at least in the 50s and 60s. And so my uh, mother-in-law-to-be would not have come to our wedding so we went to something called the pre-Cana classes in the Catholic Church at St. George's in Ontario. And for four weeks, we were lectured about marriage. Now, I, being raised a Catholic, I had received baptism, penance, First Communion, and uh, confirmation. I was familiar with Catholic tradition and teaching because I was raised in it. I understood it. Marie also. So to please Mama, I said, let's just go to the pre cana I want her to come to the wedding. And so we went. But I was kind of direct. So in the classes, when the priest, his name was John, came up and started sharing, I asked questions of him. And afterwards, he wanted us to wait around. Once again, I get in trouble with the priest. So <laughs> he wanted us to wait around. And he walked with us to our car. And he said, you, he said to me, I'll never forget this. You're not Catholic, are you? Because I had shared about Christ and how you're saved. I had shared that in the class. And he said, you're not Catholic, are you? I smiled. I was raised Catholic. I understand Catholic doctrine. But you're not Catholic, are you? I said, no, I'm not, John. I said, I've been set free by Christ. I follow Jesus. And he goes, yeah, I could tell. Why are you in this class? I said, why are you in a dress? No, he said, why are you? Why? I'm sorry. Why are, you in this? why are you in this class? I said, my, my mother-in-law-to-be will probably not come to our wedding. He said, you really shouldn't. I said, I know. I know. So we talked. And I said, you don't mind if I call you John, right? I said, because I don't see you as my father. He says, no, I'm cool with that. I said, good. He was a young priest. And he, I, he says, well, I want to tell you something, Dave. He goes, I have, I have never had a date in my life. I've never gone out with a woman. He said, I just know I'm called to celibacy and I came into the, the priesthood and, and he's sharing his story with me. He says, but you know what happened recently? I said, what? Now, you got to understand, I'm in my early 20s and I'm talking to a priest. Any, any ex-Catholics in here or perhaps you're practicing to this day, anyone knows that those people are above you. That's the way we were raised. And so I'm talking to him as just a guy, because that's what he is. And he says, 
He goes, you know, but I want to tell you, because you'll understand. He goes, I have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He says, and I've gotten away. And he's just sharing with me. He goes, I've gotten away with, from, uh, from the things I was taught traditionally. He says, and, I, and I'm just following Christ and his word, and I'm walking in the power of his spirit. And like, like the arrogance of my youth and ignorance of my, who I was, I said, you're not far from the kingdom, John. You know, who am I to tell this guy that? But I just, you're not far from the kingdom, John. Get in the word, walk in the spirit, and watch what God will do in your life. A couple of years later, somebody said, you remember John from St. George's? I said, yeah. He got married. They said he left the priesthoods following Jesus and married. He's married. See, so in my case, why did I tell you that story? Because I'm still blessed by it all these years later, but also because you look for an introduction not in a rude way, not in a, I, I know more than you, but you look for an introduction. In, in preaching, it's called, you look for a hook. You want, you want to draw them into something you mutually understand. That's what you're seeing here. Look at how Paul addresses them. Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He's not being impolite. He's just saying you are very superstitious. King James uses the word superstitious. You're extremely religious people. As a, as a, a, a group of people, he says in verse 23, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. There's his hook. I noticed your monument of stone upon which an idol is normally placed. You see, altars for worship were erected everywhere. But this was, in case you forgot somebody, in case one of the gods was omitted. That's what this altar's for. And so now he's introducing the gospel to intellectuals. The one you worship without knowing, he says, is the one I've come to proclaim to you. You don't know his name, let me tell you who he is. This God is none other than the God of Israel and the God of the world. And this is the one that I'm now proclaiming to you. He begins by speaking first of God the Father because he's going to introduce the ability to speak of the Son after he begins to reveal to them the God of the universe. And he shows them that he was bringing neither a new God nor a, a new worship, if you will, among them. He's explaining that the worship of one already acknowledged exists. He, you just don't know who he is. I've come to tell you who he is. And so he says in verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So God can be known is what he's saying. God made the world. He's the creator, but not contained by creation. He's above it, not part of it. Immediately, the Epicureans and Stoics who are there become angry, upset, because Epicureans believed that matter was eternal. It had no beginning. And it had no end, but Stoics believed that God was part of everything, and all things were part of him. And he's saying God has made all things and is separate from all created things. He says in verse 24, he's the ruler, he's the Lord of all things. Why? Because he created all things. Like the psalmist, Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's, all it contains, the world, and those who dwell in it. He says in verse 24, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. God in the book of Isaiah in chapter 66 verses 1 and into the first part of verse 2 says it like this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? Where is the place of my rest for all these things my hands have made and all those things exist, saith the Lord. God doesn't dwell in a temple made by human hands. Because nothing you've ever made can contain him. Don't you understand that? Because it, we cannot build a temple suitable for him. What did God do? He built his own. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, the question is asked, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? See, some people say, well, I'm going to church, and they forget that they are the church. Some people will go to a building like this on a Wednesday or on a Sunday and they'll come whenever 
But the rest of the day, when they're not in buildings like this, they forget who they are. The Bible says, no, God, God can't be contained with, with structures made by human hands. So he created his own temple. He, he created you. And you are the temple of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. So wherever you go, God is from within. That means, amen. And that means what you choose to do, you're taking along God with you. So you want to go to a certain show or a certain thing that is going to use his name in vain or do things that are improper, you're inviting him along. When you're sitting at a bar or sitting at your home, you're inviting him along. It isn't the building. You're the building. And the church is simply when we all gather together for services, but you're always the church once you leave this place. And so it's not this building. It's us. And he said, God doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. And he says in verse 25, he's not worshipped with men's hands as if he needed anything. He's the one who gives. He needs nothing from us. We didn't create him. He created us and he sustains us by the word of his power. He, in the book of Job, chapter 41, verse 11, who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine, God says. In verse 26, he says, uh, he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. Uh, he's made from one blood every nation. There is no superior nation, including you Greeks, who think that you are superior, because the Greeks thought they were superior and everybody else was simply a barbarian. It says in verse 26, he determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries. It speaks of the migration of various nations and their futures. He also established the borders of the lands that they inhabit. So in doing this, Paul is opposing Stoic's fate and the Epicurean's concept of chance. He's describing the periods and places in which nations flourish to the will and prearrangement of the living God. And notice in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. And find him, though he's not far from each one of us, that they might seek and grope for him. Grope is an expressing, uh, expression of, of, of walking in the dark, groping in the dark. It speaks of sin nature. Creation, in other words, should cause people to seek the creator. And conscience and nature should make people accountable to him. God gives to us a conscience, and you know when your conscience is violated, even if you're not saved, because there are standards and ethics and morals that you know you violate, you're not keeping them. That's why they say your conscience is stricken, and, and creation by itself speaks about a creator. Every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. So these are things that are witnesses, and that's why in verse 28, he says, in him we live, move, and have our being. It's by God that we have life. It's by God we have strength to move. It's by God that we even can continue to live. It's the God who made us, who preserves us, and it's the God who directs us in our life. And he says, your own poets, verse 28, recognize that there's a God revealed in nature. They're aware of what I'm saying is true. Instead of being idolaters, you ought to seek to know the living God. And then he goes on and says, after saying we are his offspring, in verse 29, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. God created us. Why would we lower ourselves to be even less than animals? God isn't an idol. He's not made with human hands. It demeans him and it lowers us. And then he went on to conclude, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Areopagite a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so we'll close with this. When he says in verse 29, we're the offspring of God, God has created us. But he goes on in verse 30 to say these times of ignorance. In other words, 
you're now being held accountable because I'm revealing to you purpose and I'm revealing to you Jesus. You have already revealed your ignorance by your altar to this unknown God, but you have now been informed of the one who is God and you now have information and accountability. You've heard. And now you have to respond through repenting. Repenting, well, for the Greek to think of new aims or purposes, the rejecting of the past, that's unheard of. To think of judgment to come by one person, I can't believe that. But he's saying Jesus is the judge. He's the one who's appointed. In John 5, Jesus said, the father judges no one. He's assigned all judgment to the son. And so that's what we're to emphasize is the reality of Christ the Savior who saves us from coming judgment. In 1 Corinthians 1, through 24, the Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so they hear of the resurrection. Some of them mock. And others say, we'll listen to you. Some think that resurrection is absurd. But others listen and they begin to question. And so you have a small response. In verse 34, you have Dionysius. Dionysius is a member of the court. He's a man of high standing. Damaris is not a member of the court, but was an Athenian who heard and was saved. Paul is about to leave, and we'll close with this. He's going to leave Athens with very few people responding, and he's going directly to to Corinth. We'll see this next time we gather. And in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, he says this, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He came on quicker to them. Now, of course, he knew his audience. He was speaking to intellectuals. He was laying a foundation. But when he went to Corinth, which had become an even greater city in terms of its political power, he said, I made a determination. I'm going to go to the heart of the matter. I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ and him crucified. I didn't come being wise. I didn't come to flatter you. I didn't come in any way to be regarded by you. I came to give you the one who can save you, Jesus Christ. When he spoke to the Athenians, as is so typical with the intellectuals, they're, they're looking for things to, to argue about instead of taking the substance and the point to consider. That's still true to this day. When you speak to intellectuals, very often they deflect. They don't want to hear that. Well, you said this, how come you, instead of going to the heart, the heart of the matter, according to Paul, was that Jesus Christ was resurrected. You are called to repent. He is the judge of the whole earth. Athenian, you will be judged. I don't want to hear that. I wanted to hear what this seed picker had to say, and I don't buy into it. But others were listening, and they were saying, there was an emptiness in my heart that he seemed to be addressing. I want to hear more of this. But there are very few wise according to the standards of this world who are saved because the Lord has a way of reaching into those who have just an honest desire and are not confused by so many things and know themselves enough to know that I'm lost and I need help. And that's what Jesus does. He finds you and he helps you. And that's the heart of salvation through Christ. And that's what Paul wanted them to know.